Good evening, very welcome to our evening worship this evening. Glad to see you all. Welcome all here and those who are visitors. Glad to see you. Uh, we pray God will bless us. Just a couple of things to announce. Remember this week on Tuesday evening, we have our midweek meeting, Bible study, prayer. Uh, that's at half past seven here in the minor hall. Prior to that, the session will be meeting at around seven o'clock. Uh, then there's the pro Nata meeting of the Presbytery. That's in Clock Mills on Wednesday evening at half seven. On Thursday evening, the girls' brigade, as usual, uh, meet here at the usual times from half six onwards. And do you remember next Lord's Day morning and evening worship at the usual times, 12 and 7, and we have our 6.30, and we have our prayer time on the phone at 11 o'clock in the morning. We come this evening to, to worship God, and as we do so, we just remember these words of Jesus as he spoke uh, about him laying down his life, and he says, I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. We'll be thinking this evening about the authority of Christ as it is questioned by the Pharisees, the chief priests, and the teachers. So we come to God this evening praising his name. We're singing Psalm 98, the A version, and we're singing this whole portion. Uh, as we have no presenter, we're following again, singing along with the psalm as it is played uh, over the system. And the tune is Converse 257, Psalm 98a, 1 to 7, and the tune is 257. Here's the psalmist, Come, sing to the Lord a new song, for great wonders he has done. His right hand and arm most holy have for him the victory won. And as we sing those words, we're reminded of the, the right hand of God, Jesus Christ, and of the great victory that is his, the salvation that he brings to us. So Psalm 98a, 1 to 7, we sing along with this psalm as it is played. Let us praise God together. <clears throat>
us pray. Our gracious, loving Father, we wonder at your great love and mercy toward us in that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, that we, through him, might have life, be forgiven our many faults, and enter into a relationship with our God and our Father in the uh, uh, the blessing uh, of Jesus as our Lord. As we come to you this evening, we pray again, O God, that you would stir up our hearts, encourage us through your word, lift up the light of your countenance upon us, and may we know your blessing. Father, present yourself with us and accept of us, we pray, through the Holy Spirit, we ask these things. Amen. <clears throat> Please turn with me in the Word of God to the prophet Malachi. We're going to read from the prophet Malachi and chapter 2 at verse 17. Turning in the Word of God to Malachi and to chapter uh, 2 at verse 17. <clears throat> <clears throat> Malachi chapter 2 at verse 17 let us hear God's word God has already spoken through his prophet to Judah speaking to them about some of the matters concerning them and now he says, verse 17, chapter 2, Malachi, You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying, All who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or, where is the God of justice? See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soup. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord, as in days gone by, as in former years. So I will come near to you for judgment. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive aliens of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. You have said harsh things against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? 
You have said, it is futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evildoers prosper, and even those who challenge God escape. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them, just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. We end there at the end of the chapter. We pray God will bless to us his word. <clears throat> we come this evening to some matters for prayer, and we are thinking through some of the countries of Europe now, and we want to just give focus this evening to the Netherlands, uh, where we have uh, a population, as we're told in the Operation World website, a population of 17 million people. Uh, and although the Christian population is 46.6%, uh, the number of practicing or evangelical, we note, is only 43 And if we know anything of the history of the Netherlands, we will realize that it was a place, and still is, there, there are many denominations, Christian churches, it was a place of great Christian teaching. But today, uh, we know that Christianity seems to be at a low point. It is a Christian nation uh, where many refugees, Jews, uh, and others have come, but today it is really a secular society. Indeed, the Operation World website tells us the Netherlands leads the world in promotion of secular and New Age views and values. Few restrictions exist for drug use, deviant lifestyles, prostitution, euthanasia, and abortion. Half the nation's church's buildings are now either destroyed or converted for use as bars or mosques. Pray for revival and rest restoration of national spirituality. Maybe one of the indications of the low ebb of the wider Christian church is a statistic to do with Roman Catholicism is rapidly decreasing 41% in 1975, 26%, or some even as low as 18% in 2010. Uh, so uh, even there, uh, many have uh, fled, just abandoned anything to do with the things of the church. Weekly attendance in Roman Catholicism could be as low as 300,000 on any given Sabbath day. The historic Protestant churches also have suffered calamitous losses from 60% in 1900 to 18% in the year 2010. Half their membership in, by 2015 was over the age of 65. So there's a great need. So pray for the Netherlands, pray for the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Netherlands. Uh, pray that there will be work done among the least evangelized. Uh, the Netherlands is a place where many people have come from other countries. Uh, there are many migrants there. Pray for them as uh, opportunity arises. There are also many Muslims and an opportunity to witness among them. So we just highlight the Netherlands as a place of prayer. And as we think of prayer, want to remember our own church. We are aware still, uh, as we come to another year of congregations without pastors, uh, of the need for men. Pray that God will call men to our college for the next intake, that God would be pleased to raise up preachers of the word. So with these matters before us, if we're able, let's stand as we come to the presence of God in prayer. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, as we have just highlighted some 
of the needs in the Netherlands. We are conscious, O oh God, of that society, many ways like our own, that has descended from high Christian and spiritual values to being a very much a secular place, a place where anything seems to go and where your church seems to be in decline. And yet, Lord, we come to you with prayer because we know that you are the God who is able, even in the midst of the darkness, to cause light to shine and to bring blessing to your people. And we would pray, O God, that you will lift up the light of your countenance upon those who remain in the Netherlands faithful to you. And there are those who are seeking to witness and speak the word of the gospel into the lives of men and women, of boys and girls. And we pray, O God, that that testimony will, under your grace, bear fruit, that you will call people forth. We know there is a need to witness to the many who have come into the Netherlands from other countries, many who have come uh, have hoping for a better level of living. Lord, we would ask that as these many immigrants uh, at come in among the, the Dutch people themselves, that you would give opportunity to Christians to speak to them, and that even among them you might fire up your church, bring more under the power of the gospel for the glory of your name. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we reflect upon the need there in the Netherlands, we see the need for witness, for preaching, and for your word. And Lord, we would recognize that as the great need in our own nation, that our people might hear the gospel of life, that you, O God, in mercy might pour out your spirit to change the hearts and minds of men and women. And Lord, we pray again for our own denomination as we seek to be faithful to Jesus Christ, our Lord and our King. And we would pray, O God, that you will cause the light of your countenance to shine, uh, that we would be faithful witnesses for you. We think of the need that we have uh, for men to be called forth to the ministry and to the work of preaching. We pray, O God, that as we uh, think about this matter, you will be pleased to put it in the hearts of those who would be your chosen men to bring your word to the coming generations, and that you will equip them, that you will mold them, and that you will make them the men ready to serve. And Lord, that you will show them clearly the call that you would have on their lives. We remember the two men at our theological college at the moment. We pray for John A. Fitzsimmons and for Kenny Stevenson. Bless them in their study. And Lord, we pray that you will be equipping them in these days, both through their study and their interaction with people as they preach here and there, and as they look forward to a placement in the summer. May they be used of you, O God. Mightily bless them. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can commit all our need to you. Father, we come to you again for our own need. You know us individually. You know us as a congregation. We cry out, O Lord, that you would strengthen our witness and enable us to continue to be light for the people around us, that they might come to know Jesus Christ, the Savior, and walk in his paths. Lord God in heaven, hear our prayers. Continue also to hear our prayer for the many needy within our fellowship and associated with us in our families. We pray, O God, that you will bind up the brokenhearted, touch those who are laid aside physically, and may you bless and undertake for those who are distressed in mind that they might know the peace of God through trusting all to Jesus Christ, the blessed Savior. For it is in his name we pray and for his glory. Amen. <clears throat> Please turn again in the Word of God uh, to uh, the truth, and we come to Matthew chapter 
uh, 21, and we're going to read from Matthew 21 at verse 23. Matthew chapter 21, and we're going to begin to read at verse 23, and we read down to verse 32. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 21 at verse 23, let us hear God's word. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? they asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from men? They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. Then he said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first they answered. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Amen. We pray God will bless to us his own word of truth. Before we turn to this message again, we're going to sing praise. We're going to turn uh, to Psalm 51, uh, stanzas 1 to 6, 51a, 1 to 6, and the tune, I think, is Top Lady 241. Here's the psalmist crying out to God uh, in his uh, awareness of his sin. Remember David, confronted by the prophet Nathan, recognizing his fault. What can he say? God, be merciful to me. In, on your grace, I rest my plea. He comes to God knowing that he must rest upon God, that only through God can there be cleansing. And so he goes on crying out that he might be made pure and clean by the sprinkling of the Lord and that he might be restored to give uh, a, a word of confession and showing the perfect ways of God. Psalm 51a, 1 to 6. Once again, we sing along as the psalm is played. Let us praise God together.
today we have uh, in our society a people who are very ready to question authority. Perhaps in the past, uh, certainly I can look back long enough to think that it would have been a strange thing if someone questioned the authority that was over them. But today, that seems to be something that happens regularly. We hear the words, what authority, what right have you to speak to me in such and such a way? We see that even at the highest levels. People question even the government. What authority have they to enact or to tell me or to lay down such laws? There is this individualistic selfishness in men, and they don't want to be under authority. And in our present age, that is given much voice. A policeman might rebuke someone or speak to them, and they might well get the retort, what right, what authority have you? And yet, we can look back, some of us, and say, when the policeman spoke, you listened because you knew he had the badge of authority on him. And as we think about this with regards uh, to other aspects, we see it in many areas of life. And it is also something that crops up in regard to our Christian attitudes and our ways. We may come with the gospel. We will put forward what we believe to be the biblical point of view on some issue which is under debate. And we might be saying that this is the truth. This is the way it ought to be. And people will push back. They'll say, what authority do you have? You have no right to tell me what to do. What authority? And as we seek to speak the word of God, then people will cast that up to us. You have no authority. Of course, if we are trusting in Jesus Christ as Lord, I hope we're speaking the truth according to his word. And that is our authority. It is not my word, but the word of God. And so as we think about that, we know that many people will challenge, challenge us when we would challenge them. And so when we come to this portion in Matthew, it perhaps does not surprise us overly that those who were opposed to Jesus questioned his authority. Here were the chief priests and the leaders in the temple, Jesus is teaching, speaking to the people. And remember, the people heard him gladly. He taught them as one who had authority, and they recognized something about him that was different. It was uh, uh, coming to them with power and with a directness, a freshness. And yet the teachers of the day, the chief priests, are the ones as the religious leaders who come and are questioning by what authority. We look then at this portion that we have read because as we think about this, this incident in the temple, this question about authority is actually what leads to the parable about the two sons. And Jesus is still answering the question that is posed to him. Uh, when he gives that parable. In fact, he makes a very pointed application at the end of the parable. So let's just think, first of all, about a question about Jesus' authority. Here are the chief priests, the elders, and he is teaching, uh, and they are hearing him. They have observed him. In one sense, we might be rather surprised that they have to ask the question about Jesus' authority. We might say to them, have you not been listening? Or have you not observed the miracles that Jesus has done? They are open. They are being much talked about, no doubt. Surely they have recognized that by the miracles, the power that he has shown in healing people, in in doing all kinds of wonderful things that were to the benefit of his hearers. Surely they could see this could not be any other than a man anointed of God. That ought to have 
answered the question of authority for them. But no, while they know those things and even have heard him teach, this it runs against the grain for them because he is not, as it were, of their school. Even Jesus' teaching, the people listen to Jesus. Perhaps the chief priests, maybe the teachers are a bit annoyed because the people gladly listen to Jesus, whereas their dry uh, monologues, their dry teaching didn't get the same attention. The people did not listen to them as gladly. And perhaps all of these things made them want to do away with Jesus. Here they are then, the question about authority. You see, in their hearts, they look upon Jesus just as an outsider. He's not of their school. He's not been brought up under any of their rabbis. Therefore, he could not, in their view, have an appropriate authority, even though he has the very authority of God imprinted through his miraculous works and his faithful teaching. Sometimes people act like that in our world. People who are, are critical of others simply because they are not of our particular school of thought. They have not gone to my university or that place of learning. They couldn't be as good or they, have no, they haven't the same authority. They have no qualification for that teaching or for whatever they're saying. And we might look at them in that way simply because they did not come from where we came. Of course, that's nonsense. People come and can our ability to teach on all kinds of subjects having learnt in all kinds of places, and to bring forth that which they have learnt. But when we apply it to the Christian circles, then it becomes more difficult. We believe that what we have as a denomination, that's why we are. We believe the truths we hold. But we have never said that there are not those who faithfully teach from other places. We recognize faithful scholars and teaching that comes from other godly Christian men. We are not, I hope, like the chief priests or the teachers saying, well, they're not, but they don't belong to us, therefore they have no authority. Not at all. Many of us, certainly many of us who are ministers, greatly benefit from those who have delved into the truth in the past ages from different perspectives and even still today or have some other different ideas on some aspects that we can differ over. But in the central truths of the gospel, we know they are clear in all that they teach, and they have authority because they teach the truth of God. I wonder, have you ever questioned authority like this? Perhaps like the ungodly, coming and saying, you have no right to tell me. By what authority do you teach? How come you teach these things? And we must respond and say, the authority comes from the living God himself. Because if any of us who are called to be preachers are preaching, it must be not what I say, but it must be the very word of God. We are not declaring simply some political statement, some personal ideals, or some uh, pattern that we have dreamt up for ourselves. No. It's no private notion that we are dis dis seeking to tell others of. It is the truth of the living God. And when we preach the truth, we come not to speak as men, but as men serving Christ and our authority. And when you go out and speak to a neighbor and friend and you speak the truth of God, it's not your word. It's Christ's word. And you can stand over it. You can point to the scripture and say, this is the word of God. That gives you the authority, not because of who you are or what you have done, but because you speak simply God's truth. A question about Jesus' authority. But then Jesus answers 
with a counter question about John's authority. Some of us, maybe as younger Christians, we read this and we think, well, Jesus didn't really answer the question. I mean, he just asks another question. But the point is this. His question is the answer to the first question. Because if the, far, the teachers and chief priests had understood who John was, if they'd been able to answer Jesus' question, then they could have answered their own question about his authority. This also was a sort of normal process of debate. Someone raised a question. Someone put a counter question to help them to think through the issue. And that's simply what Jesus is doing. And he asks about John's baptism. Was it from heaven or from men? And in a sense, he's really asking, what authority do you think John had? Where did he get his authority to baptize? Jesus knew what would the, the, the thinking of the, the chief priests. He knew the people. He knew John. And he knew that John was a prophet of God. He had spoken of Jesus. Remember, John pointed to Jesus, the Lamb of God, who would take away the sin of the world. John had baptized a baptism of repentance, and Jesus calls us to repent. Jesus knew that if only they could see that what John was doing was actually a fulfillment of the prophetic word. And we read from Malachi, the one who would come calling in the wilderness. This was God's servant preparing the way for the Messiah. If only the chief priests and teachers had come to admit that, then you can see how it would follow through. Jesus, doing miracles and teaching as he did, must also be from God. They would have to recognize that Jesus had authority from the living God. So this counter-question of Jesus strikes at the very root of what they need to be thinking about. They need to get to understand who John was. And then from that, they will understand the authority of Jesus. Perhaps that's something we can do. If someone asks you, what authority have you for speaking th this truth? We could maybe think about a counter question. Well, what authority have you not to listen? Or we could ask them, well, where do you think truth comes from? That's an interesting question for someone to think of. Where's your truth? On what do you base your whole life's stratum? And as they think about that, they will soon hopefully begin to realize that they have constructed a life uh, a pattern, a thought, that is all based on men. And what authority is man? They have none. Except that we are created by God to worship and honor him. As we would speak to other people, questioning them about certain issues is a good way to open up their hearts, to make them delve deeper into what they think, and to cause them to realize they need to think about their question. And so, as Jesus here answers jo uh, the chief priests, the teachers, with a counter question, he is actually answering their question. And we sometimes can take that in our evangelism and outreach and speaking to others and use it to delve into the hearts of men to hopefully cause them, by God's grace, to learn more of the truth. But then thirdly, I want to just note their reaction. What an unwillingness there was to reply. And we have the whole discussion laid out by Matthew as he records this scene. We read of their thinking in verses 25 and 26. If we say that John was from heaven, and if they were honest with themselves, they knew, they knew that John was a man of God. If we say he's from heaven, and here's the, they know 
that Jesus will say, well then, why do you not act and follow him? Why do you not do as he says? And of course, that included Jesus, the one John pointed to. But on the other hand, the chief priests say, if we say he was only a man, which is really what they wanted to do to deny Christ, then the people, the people will be up in arms. And isn't it interesting that the ordinary people, the common man, by God's grace, understood that John was a prophet of God. They listened to him, they flocked to him, and from John, many followed Jesus. But these chief priests and teachers are in a quandary. They're stuck because of their own preconceived uh, bias. And so they will not answer. They will give no reply. They hide, as it were, behind the screen of I don't know. In reality, I think they did know. Their heart of hearts they knew. They knew what they ought to do. But isn't there a lesson there for you and me? Sometimes God speaks to you, challenges you, and we pretend not to understand or not to know so that we do not have to follow some personal sacrifice or difficult way to serve the living God. We sometimes are unwilling to answer the question Jesus poses us, will you serve and follow me in this particular area of life? And we say, well, I don't understand, or I don't know. And we hide behind a screen of I don't know when in our heart of hearts, and by the help of the Spirit, we really do know. We understand, but we're not willing to give in. That's a lesson that we need to learn, that we need to hear the Word. We need to accept the cut of God's truth to our hearts, and act upon it. We should not fudge the issue. We should not be like the chief priests who argued both sides and decided they couldn't decide. No, we must recognize the truth, follow it, serve it, and walk in it. But that doesn't end the matter because it is out of that that this parable is brought before us. And the story of the parable is quite clear. We have read it. This man, farmer, or a vineyard old owner, has two sons. And he asks them each the same, to do the same thing. Go to my vineyard and uh, do some work there. Go to, and work today in the vineyard. And both these sons reply differently as we read. Verse 29, the first, I will not quite brash and bold. And the second says, I will go. But what they actually do is completely different. So let's just quickly look at these two men. First of all, the willing son. Here's a man, seems all eager and keen. He says, oh, I'll go. Yes, I'll go. I'll be there. Don't worry about it. We're not told much more about this son. But what does he do? We're told that he does not go. He's, he wants to put on the cloak of obedience, but he is disobedient. And we might say that perhaps he is like the Pharisees, the teachers, the chief priests, saying that he will do something for his father and not doing it. There they were, all cloaked out in their religious garb, saying they will serve God. But when the Son of God came, they would not recognize him, nor be willing to sit under his authority. They were unwilling to serve him. So although the willing son says, I will go, he is actually the unwilling son, the one who is not going to do what he ought to do. And I wonder at times, is the real lesson, are we like this? We say we are willing. We protest that we will do, but we don't do. Maybe we have no intention of doing. And what a testimony 
stands against us. As this, on, this son has a testimony against him, his brother at first says, I won't go. But then he goes. And that brother stands to condemn this man who says, I will do it, but doesn't. What a testimony against those of us who say we are concerned for the glory of God to honor his name, and yet we're not doing it. When somebody who is lost in the world, in the midst of sin, is converted and begins to do the very things we don't do. That leads us to think about what I've called the repentant son. Here's the one who is truly willing. His first reaction is terrible. I won't go. He treated his father with dishonor. He says, I'm not going to go. He denies his father. He is, he is just a, a, a bad son, not prepared to serve. And he is unwilling to do what he's asked to do. Unthankful, ungrateful son. But, but, when he goes off and does his own thing, he has second thoughts. And he soon realizes he has disobeyed. And what does he do? He gets up and goes to the vineyard and does just as his father wished. And Jesus makes the point, which of these two did what the father asked? Well, it's clear, isn't it? It's this repentant son. He has come to do what the father wished. And as we hear the message of truth, our first reaction should be to accept it and follow it and serve it willingly. How terrible if we were like this son and say, I won't do it, I'm not going to listen. And there are those like that, brought up in the church, taught the word of God, they say, I'm not following that way. I'm not going to submit to Jesus. Let's pray for them to be like this son, that they will awaken to their sin, that they might open their eyes to understand their lostness, that they might repent and come to do what they should have done at the beginning, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and followed him, served him, honored him. That would be a joy. They would then be doing what they were asked to do to the glory of God. And so the repentant son is one who, in fact, is the better son. Perhaps he speaks to us as we see in the pointed application that Jesus makes of the, far, of the prostitutes and the tax collectors. For Jesus drives home the lesson at the very end. Which of the two did what the Father wanted? It wasn't the one who said he was willing, who doesn't do anything. No, it's the one who at first, in an obstreperous disobedient manner says, I won't go. But he has second thoughts, and he goes to serve in the vineyard. What does Jesus say? Look what he says. I tell you, and he's speaking to the chief priests and the other people hearing, I tell you the truth. The tax collectors, the prostitutes, are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. What a testimony. These tax collectors and prostitutes, the chief priests called sinners, they looked down their noses at them here with a rabble, the scum of the earth in their view, because they were not religious and they were not serving or following the law. And Jesus says, when they hear me and follow me and take on board the truth, they are entering the kingdom of God ahead of the religious people. What a challenge to the religious people of today, to you and me. Could it be that we are chief priests, elders, not accepting the authority of Jesus Christ in his truth and word, and yet those who have abandoned and gone far from him are coming to repent and believe 
and they stand as a testimony against you if you have not served and are not serving Jesus as Lord. And so Jesus is very clear what needs to happen. They need to become repentant, believing people. And we note the sad words of verse 32, even after you saw this, that is speaking there of what had happened, even after you saw these things, you did not repent and believe. When you saw John at work, when you knew of him teaching righteousness, you did not believe. You're the religious leaders. You're the people who should have known. But you did not believe. Yet the prostitutes, the tax collectors, those who know their need, have come to him. What a word of challenge. Do you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you serving and honoring him? Do you accept the authority of Jesus Christ as the truth of God that we have in the scriptures as the, his word to you, as the word of God to your soul for your good? Then believe it. Follow it. Serve it. And pray that God will lead you. Be like the one who would say, I believe and I understand and I am doing. Not like the one who says, oh yes, that's fine, but then does nothing about it. May we learn to follow our Savior more and more and to exalt him. And if someone asks you by what authority, think of a good counter question. Why should they ask you that? What authority have they for believing what they believe? And perhaps God might use that to open their hearts to become a son who repents having fled the truth. Amen. Just as we're seated, let us pray. Father, there are things here to challenge all of us in our own lives, even as believers. So often we fail to do the very things you challenge us to do. We perhaps, like the chief priests and teachers, hide behind the screen <coughs> of thinking we don't know when you have made it plain to us, when we do know. Help us, O oh Lord, if we're in that situation, to be like this son. Repent and go and do what you have called us to do to the glory of your name. Cause us, O oh God, to be faithful servants. And if any as yet are still rebellious, Lord, change the heart. Renew, we pray, by your grace, for the glory of God. Father, apply your word to us in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to conclude this evening as we turn to Psalm 126. And these four stanzas, uh, the tune is, will be St. Stephen 1. Five, four, Psalm 126, and here's the word of the psalmist. He speaks here about bringing back the exiles. The Lord brought Zion's exiles back. In the church, we always have those who are exiles. We want them to be brought back. And there's joy, laughter, because of the, that the Lord great things has done for us. Our joy has come. And we go out walking to and fro with the precious seed of the word of God. But we will return rejoicing because that word will bear fruit. Psalm 126, 1 to 4. We sing along with this psalm as it is played. The tune is 154. Let us praise God together. The Lord
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with God's people now and always. Amen.